Now, if we think back to our atom here, and we think about our computer, remembering that the computer actually acts basically like a clock. A lot of these chips here are adding up numbers, but a lot of them are actually acting as a clock to regulate the traffic on the chip. Now, how fast could that clock get? Well, this thing runs at about 300 megahertz. That's 300 million cycles per second, 300 million oscillations per second, 300 million times per second that this chip sends out an instruction to the rest of the machine. But if we look at the atom and we ask, well, what's the frequency associated with a transition between this outer level and the inner level? Or what's the frequency associated going from the first floor to the ground floor? We actually get a million times this. A million times 300 megahertz. A million times faster. So that's bad news for future Christmases because they'll always be a faster machine. But clocking the information is only part of the problem. If we're trying to build a super-duper computer, we actually need to store the data somewhere. And smaller means faster. So let's think about the limits of storage given by nature. Let's have a look at this atom. We have two orbitals. The electron could be in the inner one or the outer one. The electron is on the ground floor or the first floor. Zero, one. This is very much like the binary digit needed for a computation. So, how small a piece of material would you actually need to store all the information from all the printed books in the world? That's what we're going to look at. And I need a volunteer. Your name is? Zen. Zen. Would you take this one and go to the top of the stairs and just stand there? Turn around and hold up your one. And I also need this row to help me with the calculation. So we're going to start off by thinking, how many countries are there in the world? We're only going to do it roughly. So we're going to guess, what, 100? Let me just put 100 up there. So would you two stand up with your zeros? That's it, 100 countries in the world. How many major libraries do each of these countries have? Should we say 10? Yeah, 10. Would you stand up with a zero? How many floors on each one of these major libraries? Should we say it's a 10-floor building? OK, stand up with a 10. How many shelves on each of the floors? Well, let's overestimate. Let's say a thousand. Would you stand up, the three of you, with zeros? How many books per shelf? <laughs> Infinity. <laughs> let's say a hundred. Would you two stand up? Now, how many pages per book? Well, let's overestimate again, a thousand. Would you three stand up with zeros? How many lines per page? Is there a hundred? Could you two stand up? How many words per line? Is there ten? You stand up with a zero? How many characters per word? Ten? Stand up with a zero. Now, any one of these characters could be any one of the characters on a keyboard. There are 26 letters, there are also numbers and punctuation. So let's say a hundred possible characters. So you two stand up with zeros. And there we have it. So one followed by... 18 zeros. 10 to the 18 bits of information in all the printed books in the whole world. Now, if each atom could store one bit, a zero or a one. 
how much, what size of device would we need to store this information? So you can sit down now. Thank you. What we're going to do is we're going to bring on the ultimate atomic storage device. We're going to bring on the device within which, if we were using atoms as storage, we could actually store all that information, those 10 to the 18 bits. So, Ilya, would you bring on the ultimate atomic storage device? <coughs> Coming on. A little bit heavy. Thank you. Let me open it up. But it's empty. In fact, it's not quite empty, because somewhere down here, just about got it, there is a grain of sand. Because that's all you need to store all that information, one grain of sand. But oh, if life were that easy, we store ones and zeros on atoms. But the quantum world hasn't finished with us yet. Quantum physics has a sting in its tail. It goes back to the beginning of the lecture. At the beginning of the lecture, we said particles were also waves. So if you're trying to build a computer, you're trying to keep your electrons on one atom or another, can't quite do that because they're waves. You never quite know where they are. In fact, the idea of this uncertainty is very similar to what would happen if you took a photo, first with very high-speed shutter. There I am. There I am but what speed am I going at? OK, let's slow down that shutter speed. Well, I'm obviously moving to the right, because that blurring is giving an indication now of my speed. But where am I? Now, that is the root of the uncertainty at the basis of quantum physics. And so, if we're trying to shrink down computers, and trying to use atomic systems to build clocks, eventually we hit that uncertainty. So we should think, probably, not in terms of a computer, but a quantum computer. Not in terms of a clock, but a quantum clock. Now that's all for the future. And we'll be discussing a bit more about that in the last lecture. But in the next lecture, we'll be looking at how certain we can ever be about the future. Thank you. If you'd like a copy of the booklet that accompanies this year's lectures, please send a cheque or postal order for £4.95 made payable to BBC Education to Arrows of Time, PO Box 7, London, W12 8UD. Credit card orders by telephone on 0990 100 789. Dr. Neil Johnson delves into chaos for his Royal Institution Christmas Lecture at 10 to 12 tomorrow here on BBC Two. Next up today, a double bill of the big nights.